Hey, fantastic to have you here. This is David Jeunesse. I am your host for Automation Exposé. We do this on the third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and that is what it is right now. So thank you for joining us. The uh, series Automation Exposé was started by our North American user group uh, leaders. Many of them had you know, during lockdown had expressed, uh, you know, discouragement and disappointment that they weren't able to get together and have um, a good old fashioned solution showcase, which is what they asked for, where uh, a project manager, an architect, um, you know, a team, and we have a team today, has completed an application and uh, they share their application and then take questions about it. So that's exactly the model it's not not complicated but that's what we're doing uh real stories of building successful automation applications there's usually a couple of bad moments along the way we get into the bad moments and and then how we got out of the bad moments so anyway all questions are welcome team will uh, present their story in a you know, about 20 25 minutes or so and then we'll go to questions that's the model that's how we do it as you can hear by the beeps, they're still coming. Well, what are we doing today? We have with us uh, three interesting gentlemen from Open Connections, a business partner based in the UK. Uh, they're specializing in the file net and, and data cap, what we used to call the ECM space. Uh, they've been doing it a long time. We have some veterans with us. And they're here to tell us a story today about migrating and modernizing the Irish student grant process. I'll start with Stephen King, who will uh, kind of be the, the main coordinator here amongst uh, uh, the team. He's a uh, sales manager and certainly somebody who's keeping an eye on his client, his customer, and how things have uh, unfolded. We have Sean McDowell with us uh, from Open Connections as well. Manager of Products and Solutions. So here's your technology guy. And Phil Kroom, the project manager, I might hazard a guess that he may be the most important uh, element <laughs> of this. As we've talked in previous automation exposés about how important project management is. So let me get out of the way. Uh, we're awfully glad to have you here. A couple more folks straggling in and I will manage that. You guys stay on mute uh, if you're not talking, but afterwards, please come off mute and uh, let's have a great conversation. So for now, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Stephen King. Hello, thank you, David. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you well. You, why don't you take a moment, share your screen? Fantastic, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Nice to uh, be invited along. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the introductions, David. It's lovely. Um, so the main uh, the main thing we wanted to share with you today is the is a technical thing, really. It's a kind of a massive when you say a modernization, it's not a version or two. It's about a 20 year um, leap in technology that we've made here. So for the technical people here, um, that's probably going to be one of the most interesting things. How on earth do you make a leap of that? There's so many versions, I can't even think, you know, 20 or 30 versions, at least a couple of product sets. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the business driver. Obviously, by the time we get all the customers somewhat minded to do this. So we we can talk about that from our end, certainly. Um, if I move on to the next slide, just a, a little introduction to Open Connections. So we're, a, we're a, our heritage is FileNet. And actually, for those in the audience that are really, really old, our heritage actually predates FileNet. It's something called Saros Mezzanine, um, which is a product that FileNet bought. And then IBM bought FileNet. And we thought, we're not sure about this IBM. We'll, we'll run with this product called DataCap. And then IBM bought DataCap. So Whichever way you whichever way you play it, you end up getting uh, sucked into the IBM whirlpool. Um, I'm sure you can identify with that. Uh, so, uh, looking back far enough, we know a lot about FileNet. We know a bit about IBM Content Manager. Um, we are mainly a services-driven company, so we're a deployment 
organization mainly our, our strength is our uh, our technical people and we'll do work for end customers or for third parties we do a lot of work for ibm here mainly here in the uk but um obviously as as everybody knows on this call probably there's little weird corners of the ibm product set that not many people in the world are experts on so if you if you do know about it you tend to attract um attract work the solution we're talking about today so the end customer is uh susi s-u-s-i the if i say the middleman the the party in the middle is abtran uh abtran is a bpo and they're our customer um, and we've provided uh, essentially support services for the previous system for the last 10 years probably enough of an intro um i don't know how many people here i'm going to assume some people know bpf bpf uh i think it probably ran from about 2000 to about 2010 was its heyday i think the last ever update to it was in 2010 i'm doing a bit of googling this morning um there's no there's certainly very few i would imagine people in ibm that would be able to give you sensible technical support on it these days um it's probably important to say at this point that the system which was 20 years old uh was actually working pretty well so the the customer requirement was fairly uh stable and mature um the system is definitely mature um and, and generally speaking doing what it needed to uh however <laughs> it was getting i couldn't think of a better word than needy so i put it in quotes but you'll probably understand what i mean um it seemed to need a reboot of the server get you know from once a month to turning into once every couple of weeks um the version of WebSphere definitely needed a prod from time to time. Uh, and we, we could never really do much other than poke it enough to get it going again and, and off we run. Um, to be honest, that was a tenable situation, I think, for the customer. It was the system was basically up and working 95% of the time, 99% of the time. Um, what actually triggered uh, triggered a, a, a leap? Um, was a security audit within the the Irish public sector. Uh, and of course, being 20 year old software, there were all kinds of red flags about um, ways into this system. So they didn't have a breach as such, I don't think, but they, it, the system was flagged as having an awful lot of vulnerabilities. Would that be right, Phil? That's a good summary of the situation, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, if it was traffic lights, they'd be flashing red lights all over the... Uh... In fact, if Jay's got his um, Star Trek deck, he could probably do some flashing red lights for us in the background to simulate the security vulnerabilities. So there wasn't actually a problem other than a theoretical set of security vulnerabilities. This triggered a process, a public sector process, uh, of essentially looking at what the options were, um, probably a trip around the marketplace to see what uh what was around time was against them slightly in that they knew what the system had to do there was a very timely matter to get it patched up in some way um and so after some after some research it was decided that the if there's an ibm solution that's a superset of bpf uh that's that's got some things going for it so uh as everybody as everybody on this call knows sorry i'm losing my powerpoint and gaining some pictures um cloud pack for business automation is the current product uh which is again this is sales guy talking basically a superset of bpf lots of things done differently but at least the same functionality taken across um us and the customer and Abtran were all pretty keen if we can to stick to standard product that seems to work better in the long term for everybody uh obviously as you'd expect there was some new hardware involved um we definitely built the new system alongside the old system on new hardware and switched across when the 
the moment suited us. And as far as possible, we gave the users uh, the same. Um, of course, quite a lot of things are done differently. Uh, but essentially, we, we gave them at least what they had before. So those were the those were the objectives of the new system. Again, have I missed anything there, Phil, or is that pretty, pretty much? No, that's, that's pretty much on key. That's pretty much it. On the basis that Jim from Abcan hasn't popped up, I, I'm still telling the truth at this point. Um, so that's good. The one of the unusual things about this system is as a, as a student. So uh, as a student in Ireland, you still get a grant, which is a as a middle aged bloke with three kids living in England. That's a that's a dream, um, a grant rather than a loan. But anyway, they get a grant. Uh, when you apply for the grant, you get you start a workflow. And the workflow doesn't die until you're no longer a student. Uh, so obviously, in some cases, that will be years, or most cases, that'll be years. In some cases, it's probably 10 years. What it means in terms of the system um, is that you there are an awful lot of live workflows that, that absolutely need to be moved across verbatim. Uh, you know, the thought of starting with with a new clean workflow system was absolutely unthinkable because there would be an unholy mess of old system, new system, merging them, reports, statements. Uh, I think we've just we've had a question about the process of moving them. Um, is that right, David? Did you see that? Yes, and we can take the questions at the end if you'd like to continue. Yeah, no, along. no. Or in a minute, if you I'll want to take it now. We can take it. Yeah, no, that's cool. in, in a minute, I'll I'll hand over to Phil. Um, he won't be able to he won't be able to stand me trying to explain this because I'll get it wrong. But but suffice to say, there's eight hundred thousand approximately in-flight workflows that all needed to be taken to the new system. Uh, we couldn't find, and this is unsurprising, we couldn't find an IBM method for doing this because of the twenty-year gap in in product terms. That's not unreasonable to think. Um, therefore, we had to make a, a custom method, which I'm going to hand over to Phil in a second to explain a little bit more. Uh, there were quite a, there are quite a lot of external integrations to this system. Um, we've we've had to rework those again. It's such a leap in generations uh, that they needed reworking, but they wanted to do the same thing. Um, and the whole thing took maybe five months. Uh, and obviously the fact that we're talking about it and still smiling, it's going pretty well. This is about three months after the go live and we've gone through the big season for grant applications. So we've we've survived the, the rush. So I think there's a few questions popped up, Phil, not surprisingly about the a bit more detail, please, on how we chose to move those workflows across. Indeed, that, that was probably the biggest the biggest single challenge of the whole pro project. What were we going to do with the 800,000 odd in-flight workflows? Well, what, what we did to start off with, our, our approach was quite simple. And we, we, we set out to do a root and branch review of all of the process maps so we could fully understand what was going on. And it became apparent really quickly that the reason why those in-flight workflows remained active for so long was the way that the system had been originally designed. Um, the inputs into the system were driven from the uh, SUSE gas system, the grant assessment system, and the calls into the system were, were, were one of three things, um, creating new applications, updating them, updating the status to launch new activities or to update student details. So what we noticed was every time an application is generated, a certain sequence of activities were, were processed through the system. And once those activities had completed, the workflows were held in this wait for status um, holding bay, if you like. And when the new status updates come into the system, these workflows were pr provoked, prompted back into life again. So. We we took a we took a look at the system. We did a root and branch review of all the process maps, and we we organised 
sorry, somebody's saying something. We 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 reorganized the um the processes. We removed all the redundant sub maps and routes and processes, and we changed the way they worked. But we we changed the way they worked by adjusting logic in inside the system. So when the applications are first created, instead of workflows um, sitting in a in holding bay, we we completely um, terminated the process. And when the subsequent status updates arrived into the system, instead of the status updates looking for the in-flight workflows to, to launch the new activity, we, we updated the um, custom objects. The, the, the grant applications existed as custom objects in the system. Um, and those, those updates of those custom objects triggered a workflow subscription which which launched the activity that that would have happened in the old world. So that's that's pretty much how we did it, Steve. That's that's, that's more or less exactly what I was going to say, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's enough. There's been a few questions popping up for that, so I don't know, David, if you could. Um, yeah, we're right in the of... middle of the how-to uh, segment, yes. and that's that's what these questions are. So maybe we leave this slide up and we and we get into them. Hey, Paul, you started off with your first question. Why don't you come off mute and uh, and follow up and, and make sure you get uh, your your questions answered. My my initial questions are around and you have, you've already answered the in flights, but was there a need to also bring across the legacy, the closed uh, content, the the. the, the and if yes. so, how many and how did that work? Well, the the base system was was a Farnet content manager system, so all of the content existed inside that system. And then you've got the the BPF framework layer that sits on top, and the BPF user interface, uh, which was heavily customized. There was quite a lot of customizations that uh, our customer app trying to built for their customer Susie. Uh, so we we kept our approach quite simple. We knew that we could upgrade the content all the way through to the latest version of FileNet. So we did that and that, that kept intact, that kept in place all of the existing document class configurations and all of the custom objects, which were the cases. And that's all your history. That's all your history of all of the you know previous cases. So we, we moved FileNet to the latest version and then we set about uh, replacing that BPF framework. And in doing that, we had to readjust all of the, the workflow definitions um because all of those workflow maps had lots of the bpf operations which is a customer a component of, of the system we had to replace that with our own operations to do exactly the same thing um and abtran development team rebuilt the the ui the user interface and all the customizations that that existed in the previous system so we retained all of the data we replaced all of the workflow definitions and we changed the way that the system operated. So rather than having one long workflow, we had workflows launched for discrete activities based on whatever status updates and that was received. That was the giant leap in file net data migration, wasn't it? It was essentially supported. So going through all the versions it, of file net that it's missed out. It was, it was. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were quite quite far behind in terms of the version of file net, but there was a there was a supported route to get to the target version. I think we're on 5.5.10 now. So a bit of complications around merging the process and the content engine into the, you know, the CP platform that exists today. Yeah. But, you know, nothing insurmountable. And that, that was quite plain sailing. It was the, the reorganizations of the workflows. The, that was the challenge because collective, we had to work really, really closely with the, with the customer to understand you know where the redundancy was. Where, what what could we remove? Yeah, from, from Phil, the, I was you know. I was too vain to put my glasses on, but so I can yeah. only just read the. Um, I'm going to have to go and give up in a minute and go and put them on. But uh, there's a question. There's another probably quick question to answer. Um, as I understand it, the the original physical servers were made into VMs and run virtually within Abtrans network. That's right. Yeah, Abtrans cloud network for the customer, and the system was built is hosted at Abtran, the new system. 
It's in it's in Abtrans data center, yes. Yeah. So it's all obviously virtual because we're it's all, it's all virtual. And um, you know, going going back to um disaster recovery and highly highly available requirements, those are all handled at, at the uh, VM layer by our customer Abtra, uh, customer Abtran. You know, we, we look after the application inside the VMs and, and they, they make sure that those VMs are highly available. So we haven't gone into detail about those, you know, RPO and RTO requirements that, that their end customer may have, but it's all handled at, at the uh, VM layer. And is there a straightforward prod and a test? Or uh, there, how many there was lots of there was the, the test. There's quite a few test phases as we, once we had built the new solution, upgraded them to the latest version, replaced all the customizations. It was imperative that we try to keep the inputs and the outputs the same. This this solution sits in a in a big ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's called by the the SUSE grant assessment system and the. Uh, the solution calls out to the Abtran CRM system. So there's lots of web services going into the system and out out to the system. And we had to keep those the same. So the test phase was quite quite a long phase. There was lots and lots of functional testing with the Abtran test team. There was a series of performance tests uh, where we we tried to mimic the load that was expected during the peak months of the year. That, that is now quite a long <laughs> April, but it is now it is now, and it flushed out a number of issues. A number of issues that the team had to um, deal with and quite a lot of those issues lived outside of the solution itself the, the issues with the database technology and, and perhaps the, the the hardware that the solution sat on top of yeah. so yeah. we we did quite a lot of um analysis of the database and lots and lots of tuning of the different indexes and organization of the of the underlying database so we we improve performance quite a bit you know with, with our performance testing exercises good i'm relying on you now david because like i say i'm too vain to put my glasses on but i can't read the questions in a flashing way i've got mine on and it's good we have a a, a really good question from uh, caleb here which you know a lot happens in 20 years and one of the things that happened in the in the 20 years since this was initially put together are the uh the privacy laws, the GDPR, and and all the other uh, data privacy uh, regulations that are continuing to evolve. Did you have to add layers on the content management side of the workflow to accommodate privacy laws? And did you have sufficient metadata in the old content to be able to achieve that? We so in terms of security, one of the big the big objectives that we delivered. You know, with the customer was to improve the encryption, improve the security, uh, keep the data safe. Um, in terms of the test data, well, that was all. All of the test data that was created was created by the Aptran test teams. It was all um, desensitized. No, obviously, no production data was used in UAT or the development systems. Um, one of the one of the things we did do is we did encrypt the file stores. We use the the um, encryption the encryption te techniques out of the box to encrypt all of the file stores, and Abtran encrypted uh, all the databases as well using uh, TDE. I don't know if you're familiar with the. Um, what is TDE? It's Transport Data Encryption, uh, and that's a database um, encryption technology at a Microsoft SQL Server level. So all of the content data was encrypted, and all of the file data was encrypted in the in the file net storage areas. It's quite a simple process. We created a new encrypted storage area and then a bulk content move sweep to move all of the files across into the new storage area. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that GDPR says, and, and I think this is where Caleb is headed with his question okay. is, you know, if I am uh, if I'm a student and and uh, we're done with business and I say I request that you erase all of my history on your server, you have to be able to do that. Did you have to do anything different to have that kind of functionality that GDPR requests? Um, no, there were there weren't there weren't any anything that we needed to do as part of a project. But I'm sure you know if any of the I mean Jim Jim's yeah, I'll look you there. I'm, uh... I'm Jim O'Brien from Abtran. Um, 
So just to answer that question, um, uh, we are working on a project now to purge some of the older data. So SUSE, um, it's a project in our pipeline. So we are um, actively working on a project that will delete, you know, a set of data based on certain business rules. So SUSE and ourselves are actually actively working on that at the moment. So um, probably in a, a couple of months, we're going to kick that off and we'll start deleting some of the older records. So there is a, a data retention uh, policy that has recently been clarified, you know. Cool. I think, yeah, I think that's where, where Caleb was headed. So it sounds like that impacted you. And there's some wonderful questions coming in here. Um, Jim, well, while we've got you, um, so we've had a couple of questions at the start. Uh, while we were warming up about um, how did how did we ever coax a public sector organization to to upgrade something that they've got because it's a rare thing and I explained that the actual um, the thing that actually triggered you got to do something was the security problems I, mm -hmm. I assume that's right that that's the justification and then we've got all kinds of nice to haves like for example the GDPR Mm -hmm. um, things we're talking about, all the future things we can do, they're all nice to have once you've bitten the bullet and upgraded the, the software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, this was triggered by a, a security audit. Obviously, the system was working, um, but when they did the audit, they did highlight that the system was old, and as a result, they asked us to upgrade it. So um, we had to actually go to tender again. Um, so once we're a tendering process and uh, we won, won that tender. So part of that was to do this upgrade. So that's really what, uh, you know, funded this. Hey, George, you can jump in uh, live or I can repeat your question, but I prefer it if you jump in live. Yes. <laughs> so my question is the funding. What was the dance like to get the funding, and uh, what did you have to pay off? Because you, if you got funding for this, somebody else wasn't getting funding for something else. Well, there is a um, tendering process in Ireland, so um, you know government agencies they have to publicize the tender, and obviously there's you know restrictions around it. You know, it's some part of it is based on the cost, some part of it's based on you know your experience as a company. So all those things were taken into consideration. Um, given the fact that we've been working with Suzy since 2012, that's when we first started doing work with them. That kind of put us, put us in a very strong position to win that, that tendering process, you know. So Suzy could kind of see how the system was very important for their operations and, uh, you know, it was very important uh, that it did uh, go through this upgrade process. So. Um, so it, it went through an open process where we had to compete with, I think, four other companies uh, for this particular bit of work, you know. But that's how you got the funding. Hang on, hang on. That was to do procurement. Yeah. But how was the budget? Yeah, oh, the George, budget. So one, of get... things, one of the things to bear in mind, George, is that obviously the last ever patch was made to BPF in 2010. So, you know, here we are in 2022, 12 years after the, we were so yeah, to a Windows update or, a, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of attack or all of that kind of stuff that the, I think the customer appreciated that you've, there's no way to, to, to bodge this thing up. We've got to kind of do a, do a clean, a bit of a clean sheet mm -hmm. on it. Um, yeah, uh, I suppose really it came down to, uh, I suppose, between ourselves and Open Connections. So, um, like, we had had discussions with them about this in the past. So, we had rough estimates from Open Connections. So, it was kind of a combined effort between Aptran and Open Connections. So, uh, we obviously had to submit those estimates into our response. And, uh, you know, fortunately enough, we, we won that tender. So. At that point, we kind of fine-tuned our estimates with Open Connections and proceeded on that basis. And how long does the tender process take? Um, I just want to map that against what I'm used to. Uh, it can depend. I mean, um, in Ireland, uh, there's different government agencies have different things. Like sometimes they do a market sounding where they talk to various suppliers uh, about a system they like, and based on that feedback, they may change it. So that whole process could go on for 
you know, a year, but then once the a tender goes out, it can vary. But for large tenders, I mean, you're talking, you know, three months to a year, I would say, um, you know, people can respond and sometimes they provide clarifications and all suppliers are entitled to get those clarifications, you know, and sometimes they whittled it down. Like they could, you could start off with say 50 suppliers and the government may whittle it down to a small list of say five. And then those five go into another tendering process for it could be a number of months. So quite often it is, it, it, is uh it can take a number of months you know okay, so the, the first process you went through sounds like an rfi to me and the mm -hmm. second process sounds like a rfp mm. yeah it, it was like that um with this one i think we're directly into just a small group and um, sometimes the government will uh, keep a panel of suppliers you know so it'll open up and they just to say a small group you know so the, the driver came from the the public sector side who knew that they were in trouble and they had to redo things. Yeah, I mean, this system is a little bit uh, diff different because a number of years ago, Susie had intentions to replace it with a different system, but that just didn't pan out for them. So uh, it kind of got to a stage where, you know, we we're saying, look, this is too old, really, you need to make a decision on this. And, um, you know, and I suppose the fact that they did an audit and highlighted, you know, that there there was a risk there to skim the agent system that kind of prompted, you know, a new tendering process. The fear of secure lack of security motivated them to move forward and rather than just sitting. Okay. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, the system was functioning fine. You know, it was, you know, internal. So it, we felt it was, you know, being protected by, you know, firewalls and virus scanning and all that sort of thing, but at the same time, it wasn't best practice by any means. So, um, you know, and, and that audit highlighted that. It's probably yeah. worth knowing, George, that one of the other things that obviously went in our favor, I guess, was that we were quite bullish about being able to put a put a price in to do this, you know, not just a day rate and a, and a guess at the days, but a pretty firm price between the way that Abtran know this system and know what they're they've got and they know us and we know the system and between all of it it's quite a strong we, we've got the ability to put a you know not just a good price but a, a firm price into the customer that that obviously helps uh, yeah. The, yeah. The decision. yeah i'm not i'm not hearing any uh coming back for more budget yeah you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> no no Hey, we've got yes. some questions about the products being used, and uh, and and uh, why don't we segue a little bit from the drivers over to um, back to maybe some of the products here. Uh, first, uh, is this solution on-prem, cloud, or hosted? And then, second, uh, are you using BAW for workflow or and and FileNet for ECM, or is the workflow developed within FileNet? As we know, uh, FileNetters know there is a workflow in FileNet you can use. Uh, and and then I had a question as well, which is a product question. Are you using Content Navigator as the uh, as the client? Yes, yeah, the, the, the product that's probably been, question, yep. yeah, yeah. It's um, it's it, it, we we've gone from Farnet and and kept it in Farnet, and you know quite right. All the workflows were originally developed in in BPF um, framework, which uses the Farnet workflows. So what we've effectively done is taken that framework out of the equation because it no longer exists and patched it back up with some some customizations to run the, the BPF operations that previously um, operated in the, in the old system, in the, in the source system. Um, and we've kept the Farnet workflows as Farnet workflows for now. Um, they're, you know, the, the customer is now on a platform where they can, you know, the world's the world's your oyster, Jim. You can make you know leverage any of the capabilities of the cloud pack. But at the moment, it's Farnet workflows um, in the back end, Farnet content, and the front end is Content Navigator. And, and what the team have done, Abtran and, and our Farnet architects have built um, a replacement uh, user interface layer. Um, to replace the BPF layer that existed previously. So we've built what we call a case manager feature that, that's deployed inside Content Navigator, um, an EDS data layer that sits on top of it. 
and lots and lots of plugins to take care of all the customizations. And I think that was quite a steep learning curve, Jim. You know, at the start of the project, yeah. your guys had to learn a lot about Dojo and widgets and all the all the different mm-hmm. niceties that come with with developing these things inside Content Navigator. But we got there. Mm-hmm. We got yeah. there. You've, you've replicated all of the customizations. It works. It's working. I'd like to say quite well now. Is that is that fair to say, Jim? We... <laughs> yeah, I oh, know it is working. Um, yeah, there was, I think, a steep learning curve uh, customizing the BAW, and the previous solution was, you know, heavily customized and it was coded a certain way. So uh, that was something the team kind of struggled a little bit with. Uh, we're mostly a .NET development shop here, so. Um, you know, implementing the the Java um, was was a bit of a challenge for us. All right, that's for sure. So we have stuck with the content navigator. We're quite dogged, I, as I understand it, about uh, sticking with content navigator. Someone's put the comment up that plugins to content navigator would be navigator would be a good deep dive session. I I agree. I wouldn't participate much other than joining it and listening. But um, yes, as I understand it, that was quite a big thing. And there was one more question which I can answer, which is these servers are hosted in Abtran's uh, network. So Abtran is a is a BPO, the biggest, uh, I read, Jim, the biggest native Irish BPO, um, I believe. Yeah that's, uh, yeah, that's correct. We're the biggest one in Ireland, you know, so um, that's right. Yeah. So this, you've got somewhere you've got a big room with servers in it, and that's that's where these these servers live. It, it wouldn't actually matter too much to us if they were in Azure or um, an IBM cloud or who knows what else, AWS or whatever. But that's where they are. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I'm still on the user interface. There's a moment where you now introduce the new system to the uh, the knowledge workers at Suzy. And they're used mm-hmm. to doing it a certain way, and now you're saying, "Well, here's the new way." But you did mm-hmm. at least try to bridge the old to the new from a user point of view. And how did that go? Um, I'd say it went quite well. I mean, the amount of users who use the interface is relatively limited. You know, I think it's about twenty of them, so um, it wasn't too difficult and they are abtran employees so that wasn't a, a major difficulty for us so that that one's so better than i thought ich grüße, ich grüße dich auch. Ja, ich höre dich. Yep. okay keep going i'm i'll, I'll mute um, yeah so it, it went fine uh you know we just did a bit of user training it, it all went well there was no major resistance there um, the older user interface was probably tailored a bit more, you know, there's some specific requirements um, and this interface, it, we matched the functionality, but the same user experience wasn't as good, but, uh, you know, the users accepted it without much resistance, you know, um, it, it, this the overall solution uses various packages, so the, kind of the file net is just one bit of it, you know. Uh, so, so uh, no, they're happy as long as it works. Uh, you know, I think in general they're happy, and the interface works fine. Um, so, yeah, no major pushback there. Okay, we're digging in a little deeper here, and as people mm-hmm. are listening to, you, they're still going. Wait a minute. Now, did you replicate Case Manager at, uh, the functionality in the file net workflow, or did you use Case Manager? You know, B A W. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think for this, maybe, uh, Phil, do you want to jump in there and just explain how, how we were using that? Yeah, we, we replicated it um, initially. We were time constrained as to what we could do, and we didn't have probably enough time to transform the solution, the existing solution, into something new inside BAW. So that the, the, the least, the part of least resistance was to upgrade the, the Farnet backend to the latest version make use of the existing features, make use of the existing interfaces into the system and out of the system. Um, Obviously the biggest challenge was the in-flight workflows, but we changed the way it works so that discrete activities are launched and and stopped when when the activity is completed. And we we drive the activities are are launched via status updates and custom objects. So we didn't have to have these these long running workflows um you know migrated from one system to the other we could we could make use of the underlying case objects in the system 
So no, we haven't used the BAW workflows at this point. Uh, we're using FileNet workflows inside FileNet. Um, and we've, we've basically well, stripped out the to say, Phil, there's a lot of, yeah. obviously buying the BAW product, there's a lot of functionality that we're not using yet. Um, uh, yeah. Obviously where yeah. we are is that it, at least it's there and current and we can use it, uh, you know, if and when the, 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 the system demands it. So we're in a much better place, but there's an awful lot of, software that, that we own that we're not using um that's that's correct yeah yeah that's kind of the way of things with ibm software packaging isn't it that's well, i guess that's how it's supposed to work and i think it's true to say also that um as we've heard one of the big drivers was that the old software was out of support baw is the you know is the platform of the future really in terms of being supported by ibm um so that was that was also a consideration as well. Yeah, we're not at the mercy of a Windows update. Yeah, <laughs> taking us out. Yeah, Jim, are you sleeping any better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, oh, we're delighted it's gone very smoothly. And since we've upgraded, and you know, the amount of support issues has certainly dropped significantly. You know, so. Um, we were just on a call with Susie today, and you know they're very pleased with how it's turned out, and uh, you know it's been a lot more reliable, and um, and um, you know so it's performing very well. Good, good, long way. It's worth pointing out, out as well, isn't it, Jim? That we we did have a soft live. Um, we went live in January of this year, and most of the students probably still asleep in February, so not a lot of grants were, were applied for during February, but. We we had a lot of of grant applications processed through in in March, and I don't think we had any any issues to report. Not not that I'm aware of. Yeah, nothing major. I mean, the, they really started flooding through in kind of mid March. Um, so the, we've seen you know large enough volumes. So we get about a hundred thousand per year. So um, I think there's about twenty thousand at this point. You know, so um, so far so good. You know, I think. Um, Based on that load, uh, you know, there have been no issues so far. So, uh, you know, we're quite confident uh, with the solution. And we've, we've done a lot of work with the databases, tuning it as much as we can and making sure all of the different queries that are executed from Farnet and from all the customizations as well, you know, execute correctly and in a timely manner. So, please, from that point of view, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it's definitely not good not to have long running workflows um and um you know the yeah the database performance is fine so we did a bit of tuning just to make sure everything worked fine there i mean there was one performance issue with um certain cases where applications were cancelled and had to pull the audit logs from the old case to the new case but um we you know we tracked down the source of that problem and uh, we did we did a patch just to, to rectify that issue Excellent. I was just going to suggest, Steve, you move to your recap here and uh, we kind of look at uh, a retrospective or a little summary. And uh, here it is. Here's your final slide. Yeah. Um, so, Jim, I don't know if this is um, out of turn, but I guess if anyone's got a very specific Susie kind of question, you're not adverse to somebody dropping you an email or... Uh, no, that's fine. If you if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. You know, uh, Susie, they're basically a government organisation, so they're responsible for uh, the students and um, trying to take care of their the back end systems. We call them so uh, that's kind of final net for uh, document management and ECM and you know scanning and um, CRM that sort of thing. You know. Yeah, student universal support island. I think most of us are pondering the idea of getting a grant, at least here in the UK. That's uh, unthinkable, That's unthinkable. Sorry, I think you're, I can't hear you there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> most, of us are, most of us are stunned that you still get grants in Ireland. We don't know. We keep getting told we can't afford that over here. So well, yeah. well done you, well done you. Well done. Um, yeah, no, yeah we're, David, we're of course, we're thrilled if anybody's got any questions uh, for us, then either find me or Phil or Sean. Um, that's absolutely fine. Jim's Abtran, and then probably if there are any questions for Susie, they're probably better off going through Jim. Uh, mm -hmm. We can do that. 
We do have one more question that is uh, it's a follow on. And I'm going to ask Eric to come off mute and, and ask it. And uh, it's just, again, the, the migration of those in-flight workflows, the active uh, instances. Eric, why don't you ask it uh, live? Yeah, thank you so much, David. And thanks for this amazing work. Um, my background is in BAW, and we've had, you know, we've had a lot of our clients to move to CP for BA. But the biggest issue that we always run into is the migration of active instances. So even though I know that your work um, was made in FileNet workflow, but it's still the same architectural differences, right? Moving from, um, you know, from the yeah. traditional to the Liberty framework. Can you please explain more how you were able to move those active instances from the old process into the new workflow in CP4BA? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's, it's always a, a really big challenge to, to migrate any live instance of a workflow to another new system. And it certainly was going to be a challenge for us here, wasn't it, Jim? But mm. the, way that, the way that we approached it is to try and understand you know, what, what's happening, how does it operate, what can we do to save you know, the instances of the in-flight workflows today and, and have them start up again at the same point in the new system. And and what became apparent quite quickly was every time a workflow came to light to life um was driven by a, a status update into the system and when a when a status update is 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 a basically a web service call into the system uh the work the live workflow searched for and and, and provoked well, well, just to put it into this context yeah. that would be yeah some money being handed out or an application form received or a, a cancellation yeah, something exactly yeah. different different state statuses as, as the as the workflow progresses different stages of the workflow now all of the workflows the all of the grant applications were were cases in the system and those cases are essentially just a custom object in the system so the way that we approached it was to update the custom objects for every live workflow with, with its current state. And we probably added I don't know, five or six new properties to those to those case objects. And we changed the way that status object dates work. So instead of searching for workflows to to move the workflow onto its next activity, we the status updates were updated in the case objects and the workflow subscription would launch the activity that, that was being uh, was the next activity in the in the journey of that grant application. That's that's pretty much how we so did the, it, wasn't it? So the new workflows, I don't know. Let's say, for instance, uh, um, you, you get a grant approved. You know, if you get certain results or something, exam mm -hmm. results. So when you get your exam results, you send them in. That yep. that's an event that happens to the system. The new workflow map will get that event. It'll work out that it it used to be here, and it will go on. As it just as it used to, yeah. So yeah. basically, so, you, so we didn't we didn't um, migrate workflows. We we changed the way that the system operated so that workflow started and finished every time a, an update to the system was made. So basically, um, you modified the business object or the case object for each yeah. of those over eight hundred thousand instances, and then you you use that new modified object to like continue in your new uh in your new um process exactly yeah. exactly that i don't i don't think in the in the version of filenet that was in use in the existing system you could you could operate that way i don't think you could have a, a status update event monitors and launch a workflow from a from a status update date on a custom object but you could in the in the new system so we chose to leverage that and and just change that that system behavior okay, great thank you we and i assume phil we had the luxury sorry i know we're out of time Dave, but we had the luxury of being able to say on a friday night we're going to freeze the workflows where they are we're going to do all this work yeah and then on the monday morning you know when documents start pouring in and events happen they happen on the new workflow maps exactly that and one of the one of the requirements of, of abcham was to make sure there weren't any workflows in work 
in baskets in work queues so there was there was all of the yeah. in-flight workflows were stuck in purgatory if you like this wait for status state so yeah on the friday night we terminated them all we updated all of their their custom objects in the system to update them with the latest state of the of the journey of that grant application and then on monday morning everything executed in the new way so when these these grant applications had status updates received into the system the the, the discrete activities were launched for each each status update request does that make sense so we had some luxuries we had the luxury of running down the inboxes and having a couple of days to switch the system over we we did we we did and yeah, yeah that, that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. Luckily, sorry, very subjective term, but yeah. <laughs> I, I want to thank Eric, too, for pushing you to get to that level of clarity, because even I understood it finally. So thank you <laughs> very much. <laughs> it's probably me floundering a little bit of the bigger than that. No, David, no, no. You, it, you know, it's the art of uh, problem solving. And, yeah. uh, and, and that was really, I think, one of the challenges that, you know, we talked about at the very beginning, which was that you wanted to share, was how you solved that problem. And so... Uh, Certainly fascinating. I know we had some some deep uh, technical experts on today, and I hope uh, they found it as fascinating as I found it. Uh, thank you very much to Stephen King, to Sean McDowell, and to Phil Kroom. Uh, and to Jim. Connection. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Jim, for stepping in while I was probably. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to thank Abtran and Jim and and for you for jumping on like that without any prep. I didn't think you uh, when you woke up today. Did you know you were going to go on a worldwide webcast and and share what went on? But thank you for being that flexible and uh, mm -hmm. and a fascinating discussion and another great automation expose in the book. So, thanks mm -hmm. all for joining us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next one. And again, mm -hmm. big applause, please, for Stephen, Sean, Phil, and Jim.